the MSU IIT College of Education vision, mission, and goals. Our vision, a university committed to the holistic development of individual and society. Our mission, to provide quality education for the development of Mindanao and the country through relevant programs in instruction, research, and community engagement. The College of Education goal, to produce highly competent teachers who will provide leadership in various disciplines through quality instruction, research, and extension to enable them to meet the demands of their social environment and its diverse cultures, thus making them productive agents of change in response to the country's quest for global competitiveness. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to our first workshop. And I would like to recognize all representatives and colleagues from the different departments. I would like to once again remind everyone to please rename yourself so that we can easily identify you for the breakout rooms. To do this, please indicate the initials of your department before your name. To formally welcome us in this afternoon session is the chairman of the host department of this visiting <laughs> professorship. Help me welcome with a round of virtual applause, Dr. Professor Nancy Hernandez. Ma'am. Thank you, Sir Junil. To our Dean of the College, Dr. Amelia Tibuan, Assistant Dean, Dr. Luel G. Lucero. Of course, to our visiting professor who will be formally introduced later, Dr. James Bonton, the chairpersons, director, coordinators, faculty, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. So it is with great pleasure to welcome all of you in this very essential webinar. This COVID-19 pandemic had resulted in a paradigm shift on how learners can access learning. And we continue to face the major challenge of providing interactive and motivating educational experience, especially during the university closure. So in as much as we wanted to address these challenges, we have been participating a lot of webinars, which led to the development of new teaching and learning practices. And to further improve the quality of education, today we are so grateful and fortunate to have an expert speaker who will share to us about open educational practices. So there will be another workshop on October 6th and what can educational practices do for us and a public lecture on October 16 on using pedagogy assessment to teach students about knowledge production in society. So all this, I believe, can provide a broader range of innovative pedagogical options to engage both teachers and learners to become more active participants in educational processes. So I hope we will actively participate with the workshops, embrace and implement what we will be learning to keep the learners motivated and engaged during this long period of online learning. So thank you very much. And once again, welcome to this webinar. Thank you very much, Professor Nancy, for that warm welcome. And indeed, we are very fortunate to have with us an expert such as our visiting professor. And without any further ado, I think everyone is excited for this afternoon's workshop. Allow me to call in the coordinator for this event, uh, Assistant Professor J. Ruel B. Similia, to introduce to us our esteemed visiting professor. Sir J. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to request our technical to present the slide. All right. So I am tasked to introduce today our visiting professor. Our visiting professor holds a PhD in social or organizational psychology from Dublin City University Business School in 2009. He finished a bachelor's degree in applied psychology at the University College Court in 2002. He is a member of different professional bodies. 
He is a chartered psychologist in the Psychological Society of Ireland and British, British Psychological Society. He was also the chair of the Psychological Society of Ireland Division of Academics, Teachers and Researchers in Psychology from 2017 to 2020. He is a fellow of the European Distance and E-Learning Network or EDEN. In line with his academic or teaching, teaching positions, currently he is the chair of the Bachelor of Arts in Humanities Psychology Major Program, Open Education Unit, National Institute for Digital Learning, Dublin City University. He was the chair of the Open Education Teaching and Learning Committee, Open Education Unit, National Institute for Digital Learning, Dublin City University. And he served as the expert panel member of the new media technology outlook, higher education in Ireland. Additionally, his research interests with a number of publications include Processes of Identity Creation and Identity Management, life, li, Identity Life Domain Interaction, Online Teaching Learning Pedagogy and Strategies, and Higher Education Student Orientation or so Socialization Processes. Finally, he is the DCU Principal investigator of the VUCA project or Better Universities and Knowledge for All, advancing equity and access to higher education through open and distance learning, which involves a partnership with Tampere University of Applied Sciences, Finland, University of the Philippines, Open University, Mindanao State University, Iligan Institute of Technology, Philippines. Wasasan Open University, Malaysia, Universitas Terbuka, Indonesia, and Universitas Negeri Padang, Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, may I request to unmute your microphones and let our visiting professor hear our virtual applauses. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to introduce to you our highly esteemed visiting professor, Dr. James Brunton. Thank you so much for that welcome. That was so that was so nice. Um will I, will I get going? I think yeah, it's my Can you see that presentation? I'm pretty yeah, I'm pretty sure that you should be able to see my first slide. Yeah, good, okay. Yes, Dr. James. Well, th thank you for that warm welcome. Um, that was great. Uh, and you've, you've, done, you've done a lot of my work for me in terms of introducing myself. Um, so like, thanks, thanks everybody for giving up uh, a portion of your, your day to come and, and hear me talk about uh, open education and open educational practices. Um, I think the, the the, the introduction that's been given pretty much covers my background. I mean, my background is is in psychology uh, in terms of discipline, but you know my my first job, my first full time job in higher education was, you know, from two thousand seven to two thousand ten. I worked in a, a private a private college in in Dublin City in Ireland, and um, you know there I got to learn. I got to interact with different types of learners. You know, young young learners, but people who uh, didn't didn't get the second level results that were good enough to maybe go to a university, so they went to a private college. So they weren't your typical learners. And I got to to interact with um, part time adult learners who were studying in the evening time. So I was getting to know different types of learners. And then I moved to Dublin City University, where I had done my PhD in in 2010, to work on uh, online programs um really programs that were very traditionally distance education that were developing themselves into being online programs but also programs that were uh open education programs programs that had a philosophy of um having an open access entry policy so any adult over 23 
who applies for one of our courses can come and study. So it's all about trying to help them know if they're ready for higher education study rather than putting assessments or tests in you know in in the way as a barrier or you know or ask you know have people having to have certain qualifications um and i suppose working in that environment for 10 years has really taken me on a path of getting more and more into the area of open education open educational practices what can we do to reduce barriers for students to study and then once you get into that space it's kind of like how can we all help each other you know to teach to learn um i've i've seen uh i again uh as was summarized i'm on i'm a, I'm a member of the team uh for the the buka project so i've seen a little bit of the work being done in the philippines especially around um sort of expanding higher education out to you know remote parts of the country creating zonal centers but obviously I'm hoping uh, through these workshops, through uh, the breakout rooms towards the end of this session and, and the next workshop that uh, I will learn more about the, the context of higher education in the Philippines from, the, it's from everyone that is, that is here. Um, so the, the plan for today is that I should be speaking for around 40 minutes uh, and we'll try, you know, just today in this workshop, going through an introduction to open education, open educational resources, open educational practices. That's a typo. That's my first typo. Um, with, with some activities and discussion, maybe as we're going as well. And then after sort of I've done a, a, an introduction to, to those topics, we'll have uh, some breakout rooms where you'll be broken up and put out into breakout rooms to have some discussions about the things that I cover. And then we'll bring you back and some people, uh, some groups then will uh, sort of give some feedback on, on what they were discussing. But let's. Let me also, I'm going to open the chat in case there's any, and I'm going to put it down on a lower screen. So I'll just keep, try to keep an eye on that every now and again, or someone, someone tell me if there's a real uh, good query that I'm, I'm not looking at. Someone, someone let me know that it's down there. Yes, Dr. James. Thanks. So, uh, you know, I figured I'm kind of, I'm going to start with some definitions and then in a little bit after that, I'm going to critique approach. So I'm going to give you some definitions and then give out to myself. I'm going to tell myself that that wasn't the best way to start. But, you know, sometimes you have to start with some definitions. So what are we talking about? You know, like generally, if, you know, generally we're talking about open education. Um, and here is a pretty typical um, good uh, definition for open education. And you can see that it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty high level. You know, it, it talks about philosophy and you can see it's, it's referencing uh, policy, you know, UN policy, UN policies on, on sustainable development goals. Um, you know, uh, it's talking about, now, there's a quote there from Martin Weller, who would be a big proponent of um, open education and sort of open educational philosophy and practices. He's, from, he's a professor in the, the Open University UK. So, you know, openness, its key attribute is about freedom. You know, he's talking about uh, freedom. To give another quote, um, and I'll, uh, anyway, anyway to, just to give another quote from Vizina and Green from 2020, open education is not a short-term fix to a passing problem. It is a long-term solution to ensuring equitable, inclusive access to effective educational resources and learning opportunities. So I suppose these, th this definition is speaking about open education with, you know, a big O and a big E, you know, that, that the philosophy of open education is about trying to provide an education system that, that is inclusive, that, that allows equitable access to higher education and you know, we, we, I think most of us would know there are many uh, barriers in, in different countries and in generally that, you know, that, that stop people from being able to engage in higher education. Um, another term that we would 
you know, the, that you that you hear in this space is open pedagogy. Um, and, you know, the, the definition that I'm giving here is one of my favorite definitions for open pedagogy. But I know that when I first found it, I found this uh, this definition to be a little bit intimidating. You know, it, it it's it's a pretty complex um, it's a pretty complex definition, uh, and you know the the thing about open pedagogy is there's some very practical applications of it, but it is also uh, it is also an area of scholarship. And it's important to have the voices that that kind of that write about open pedagogy. They're often critical voices, and a lot of this literature overlaps with other important areas around equity of access, reducing barriers to higher education. It it sort of it overlaps with the literature on universal design for learning and equity, diversity, and inclusion. I hope I hope my cat shouting at me doesn't come through on the recording too much. Um, so. Like, you know, and again, if you look at this definition, it's it's starting to talk about other aspects that tend to come in in this in the open education, open pedagogy space, you know, that uh, issues of social justice, you know, are often discussed. Um, that 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 education is political, it highlights that. But uh, it is a def it is a definition that is slightly hard to get to get uh, on board with. Um So maybe to give a slightly more hands-on definition of open pedagogy, here is one that I took from uh, the website of a, a Canadian uh, university, uh, BC campus. They give a lot, they have a lot of sort of nice uh, down-to-earth definitions uh, in this area. So, you know, they take open pedagogy and they say, well, it's about, it's about open, what is open, you know, so when we're talking about here, what is open? It's where educational materials are in the public domain or introduced with an open license. We'll get back to open licenses. Pedagogy is pedagogy. So then what is open pedagogy? You know, that, that open pedagogy. And here they, they equate open pedagogy with the idea of open educational practices, which we'll get back to later. Um, you know, is the use of open educational resources to support learning or the open sharing of teaching practices with a goal of improving education, et cetera, et cetera, there. I don't want to fall into the trap of just reading my slides. Um, and, you know, to, to sort of, to give another perspective on this, and it's one that I would start to follow, is uh, David Wiley, who's the chief academic officer of an open education company called Lumen Learning, has, gives the following kind of very practical approach to open pedagogy. You know, and so he, he breaks down into three things. We learn by the things we do. The permissions granted by open licenses make it practical and legal for us to do new things. The ability to do those new things will likely lead to new kinds of learning. So that's his kind of pathway for how engaging in open education can take us to new places, can sort of allow us to innovate in within education. The other thing that you that, that we talk about or that you will hear about if if you start to get into the open education space is open education policy. Um, so, you know, this is just one thing I picked out from the UNESCO's recommendation on open educational resources from 2019. And again, it talks about, you know, what what is what, you know, what can we do with open licenses, you know, um, what goals, what kind of things can we try to achieve? With open education and you know it's incredibly important for us to have this policy you know, this policy out there again to quote martin weller again policy will be the lever by which open practice can become sustainable and mainstream it need you know we need to have that policy there but again policy is probably not the most uh it's not the easiest place to start to engage with an area you know, if the first thing you ever come across in open education is a complex UNESCO recommendation, you know, you might not be that, you know, it, it's not the easiest way to start to engage with a, with a, with a new, a new idea. Um, of course, one of the, I think policy has become, the importance of policy has been highlighted by uh, the fact that the pandemic 
has had such an impact on what we do. Um, so the, 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 the pandemic has caused certain new dynamics or taken existing dynamics and like accelerated them. So on the one hand, you've had people, you've had more people sharing things with each other just to help, just to try and make sure that we could all do what we were supposed to be doing. Um, and that's like, that's kind of an element of openness. People were saying, oh, here's a good guide I found on online learning, or here's, you know, here's a, a, a pack of resources I found that made it easier for me to teach online, you know, giving that to each other's colleagues. So people who maybe had more experience in that space already, helping colleagues, giving them resources. Um, and we, you know, a lot, we also had calls like this, the UNESCO call for action from 2020, you know, talking about let's use more open approaches to make life easier for everyone during the pandemic to, to provide easier access to students, to, you know, have staff have access, easy access to free resources that they can use. But at the same time, we also had um, educational technology companies running into that space saying here's our solution just pay us for this solution and then you won't have you know you'll have less problems in the online learning space and often those educational technology solutions are are closed you know they're that you know they will often come with uh, approaches that in no way would be open so in some ways life became more open during the pandemic and in other ways life became more closed depending on the the decisions that institutions made about whether to go more open or go more closed by uh, purchasing certain educational technology solutions um i've put it on the slide but this slide i have i have taken directly from uh, the pres a presentation by a very valued uh, colleague of of mine catherine cronin who's a big uh, scholar in this space as well she now works for in the the national forum for the enhancement of teaching and learning in ireland but I said, I'd say that I like given I really just took her slide and used it here because I liked it. So just for a second, I just want to get the temperature of the room on uh, whether people were already familiar with some of those definitions and, and you know, policies that are out there or whether this is very new. Uh, so I'm just going to launch a poll. Now, you should all be able to see that. So just, you know, just indicate there on the, in the poll, how familiar were you already? I'll take this, I'll take this opportunity to drink some tea. Just give it a few more, a few more seconds. We're getting good engagement. You can't see the results of that yet until I hit end poll, can you? Or can you see the results now? Well, any, any, like I will tell you from the results that I can see, most people are saying they're a little familiar uh and then with a with a an, another significant minority saying they were unfamiliar and then a few people saying they were familiar no one saying they were very familiar so that that's kind of good it means i haven't just spent time telling you things that you you all everybody already knew um yeah i think now now you should, oh wait share results there you go now now sorry now you can see the results that i was seeing so there we go so um that gives me confidence that i'm telling you things that that you don't already know um okay
Uh, and okay, yeah. So I, yes, the other question I want to ask now, and I probably have to explain it a little bit before I launch it, is you know, uh, or well, I'll put it up there and then I'll explain it. You know, uh, so the question now is like, when you see those high level definitions, you know, I mean, does it, do you, do you find that really informative? Were you, were you seeing things in those definitions that you were like, oh, you know, this is sparking ideas in my head? Or, you know, did you see them and sort of, no, they're okay, you know, okay, I'm learning something here, but you don't really know how it connects to you. Like how, what does that mean for you in terms of your teaching and learning? Or did you find them kind of alienating where it was kind of like, okay, you know, um, that UNESCO has said something about open education, but like, what has that got to do with me at all? Um, and we'll see. Don't be, don't, don't, don't feel like you have to pick informative, you know, just cause I'm doing the presentation, you know, that they are very high level definitions. If anyone thinks, if anyone's got any thoughts on that, feel free to put them in the chat. Okay, I'm gonna share. So maybe, I don't know, maybe I wrote the last option uh, it, it, maybe I made it sound too negative or something because no no one said that they found them alienating. But, you know, again, we have a split maybe 50-50 between people saying, yeah, they're informative and other people saying, okay, I see those definitions, but what do they have to do with me exactly? Um, and that's great. So, uh, again, I don't know. Sometimes it's hard to know if how Irish humor will translate into other other countries, other cultures, but... Uh, in Ireland, we would have a joke where someone stops to ask another person for directions to somewhere else. They're a bit lost. And the person who's being asked for directions starts by saying, I wouldn't start from here, which isn't particularly helpful because that's where the person is. But, um, you know, when I first, when I was working, you know, already working on an open access, open education undergraduate program, um, so I, I, to a certain extent, I was living part of the open education policy, you know, like that of widening participation, you know, um, bring incre increasing inclusiveness in, in higher education. I then started to explore more aspects of open education, and I found a lot of things about definitions and policy and sometimes the open education community itself. I found it a little alienating you know i was kind of into very practical approaches of you know what can i do to make my program better to make modules better to to widen participation in higher education what can i do to, to increase that and when you go to the definitions then it's a lot about it's it's sort of it's about open education for open education's sake you know it's talking it was talking about social justice and i was like i don't understand how i'm going to improve social justice by you know, by sharing my sharing my slides as uh, as as open resources with someone else or something. So I found some of it for a couple of years. I found it kind of hard going. Um, now, eventually, I th I don't know did I become a part of that community and I kind of I got over the start. But but eventually, I found kind of all the different elements that I was looking for, and and especially the more practical aspects of open educational practices. Um, and I understood that the scholarship, you know, those critical voices, it's important to have that there. And when you eventually, if you eventually want to write a paper about open education, you need all that literature to be there to, to base on. But I found these definitions that I've just gone through to be, you know, slightly tough going when I was getting into this space. And, you know, often in my biggest way of starting to talk to people who wouldn't be in this space already uh, is not to spend too much time or not to spend the whole time going through the history of these definitions and things. And within the open education community, all, all those different, all these definitions are, are argued over, 
you know, um, o, a great conference this week uh, has been going on called OE Global. It's one of it's my favorite open education conference. But when you go to that, I mean, the things that I've given there in terms of definitions and all that, people will give whole presentations about frameworks for particular ways of going, you know, of explaining parts of these definitions and policies and things. Um, but so what do I like to do? What do I try to do? I try to start with the basics and then I, I like to focus on the practical. So kind of the workshop one is focusing a lot on the basics and hopefully with some good examples and things to, to speak to the practical as well. Um, and then workshop two is going to focus as much as possible on the kind of idea about what problems can open educational practices solve? Because I think that's what will interest people who aren't already engaging in, in any kind of open educational practice. You know, um, some people will be motivated by the kind of higher level goals of, I want to increase, I want to reduce barriers for students. I want to increase, you know, inclusion in, in higher education. But those are hard to think about on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'll talk about that kind of in a minute. So, you know, what is open education? What can open educational practices do for us? What problems can open educational practice solve? And then if people are interested, okay, what do you do now? You know, you can't just all of a sudden click a button and be using open educational practices. This kind of a process of learning about it and starting to, to try and do it. Um, I'll say as well, a lot of what I'm talking about today uh, is drawn from the Go Open Guide, um, uh, which is something that we produced this year, which, which focuses, it was a, a beginner's guide to uh, some of these concepts. Now I got, I think I have to start talking. So I suppose one of the things that um, is a barrier, you know, there are some barriers and I want to highlight those. I want to bring those into the room and not leave them unspoken. You know, there are a lot of barriers to people engaging in open educational practices. So one is, um, people's attitude, people's general kind of cultural assumptions about how open or closed we should be with our own work and things like that. And this is just a recent tweet from uh, Brian Mathers, where he, you know, he was somewhere and he was saying he keeps bumping into people. He keeps running into this idea that people are actually not really, they're not, they don't feel comfortable with the idea of open working, that maybe it's our own uh, uh, cultural um, assumptions that like it's it's dangerous to share things you know that that if the, if something is yours you keep it private you that you keep it to yourself that you don't just readily put it out uh, for everyone else to see um and i think academic culture is often is often uh, like that as well uh individual uh, our academic culture is very uh, individualistic and i think even within certain disciplines certain subjects there's often kind of implicit pedagogical beliefs that reinforce that um often i have found myself in institutional promotion paperwork or uh, i recently was successful in in becoming a senior fellow with um advanced he um and when but the paperwork the kind of the the submission that i had to put together um when seeking that fellowship was again it asked you to say what did you do tell me about your individual journey through teaching and learning tell me about your individual achievements and it kind of goes against how I work, which is very collaborative. I work in groups. You know, I help other people. They help me. We work in teams. But it was anywhere you worked in teams, you almost had to divorce yourself from that team context and talk about yourself as an individual. Academic culture tends to push us in that direction, whereas open education is all about being open, working with other people. Um, so, the, yeah, the idea of team working, I think, can, can be a bit, uh, alien in our in in academic culture um and i hope later you can tell me whether that is very different in the philippines or whether that's the same whether that that's common the other the other problem the other barrier to getting into open education similar to getting into any other area is um lack of time and overwork uh, and it's often something that goes un, unstated or understated in in higher education there's a 20 year literature on the fact that uh higher education is is stressful working in higher education is stressful and and some liter literature says it's kind of getting worse um so it's it's tough to, to you know to be able to say oh this, okay this these open educational practices that sounds like something that would improve the way i work but 
you need to have the, the time and the space within your workload to be able to start exploring that space, to be able to, you know, design a good innovation, maybe design research around that. Um, and that can be tough. That can be tough in, in higher education. Um, you know, and this is just one area that, you know, to improve knowledge, skills and competence. Uh, your institution might be, you know, sort of highlighting multiple areas that you could potentially invest your time in to learn more about. Um, I think one way of doing one way, and especially in areas maybe of teaching and learning where uh, it's not, it may not be as valued in terms of hiring and promotion and things like that as research papers or uh, research funding, you know, seeking research funding. So you have to see in your institution a lot of the time, how will this be recognized? Will this be recognized? Will it be um, rewarded? You know later if if you've shown that you have invested time in open education and uh you know that you're innovating with open educational practices so if there's any senior managers on the call that's something for for us it's like how how are we showing people that if they engage in this space it will help them with their career progression Um, one way of doing that is to not just do open educational practices but try to wrap research around it so if you're going to you know try something out in the classroom okay well let's take a little more time and see if we can design a study around that and actually follow up and you know maybe eventually then we can publish that as research um so i'm probably going i'm talking too slowly so i'm going to just do this poll quickly i want i want to just get your get people's again read the get the temperature of the room do, do you perceive these barriers is, is what i'm saying makes sense um you know uh, really this is more for something to discuss in the breakout rooms later but you know do you do you see these barriers do any of these barriers kind of make sense or are you like nope if i decided to try out some open educational practices i could just do that i have the time it wouldn't be too complicated Okay, I'm going to go with that. Oh, I'll give ten, five more seconds. Okay. Okay, well, you're telling me through this, you're telling me through this that that uh, it's the same in the Philippines as it is in Ireland and almost any, every other jurisdiction that I know of. Um, it's academic workload, you know, have, trying to do teaching and learning research service, local, institutional, local, national, international, all at the same time. Uh, is 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 tough and that is really where the crunch comes when it's trying when you're trying to innovate um and and some of you know some of the other some of the other uh, barriers well yeah some other people not perceiving barriers small small number four and some others in the other categories as well um you know i suppose through the through we're, we're covering kind of basic stuff today but especially in workshop two what i'm going to try and do is highlight what problems do we have that open educational practices might be able to solve and you know, if, if it's making life easier than that investment, especially where it's kind of not too bad, it's not too much effort, um, that that will get people into open educational practice because it should make our life easier for that investment rather than, you know, rather than it not uh, doing that. Okay. Uh, so just again, before I start, how familiar are people with open educational resources already? Um, so just there, here, here we have another poll. It's probably it's probably the area that people will know about the most. Um, Dr. James, there is one question. Oh, is yeah. it okay to to throw yeah. the question? Let me have a look. Yeah, I, uh, yes, 
in the area yeah yeah it, it any encouragement to have patents and have copyrights uh can be a barrier to open edge can be a barrier to open education um in the same way um data protection you know the gdpr in in europe um can seem like it pushes us to be closed you know that it's all about uh protecting things and not opening things up to other people but it's it's really it off and probably with this thing as well the um now depending on how an, an institution frames it but you can put a license on something but it can be an open license you know often people they see an instruction around patents and copyright or around data protection uh i'll just share this poll um and it it people see that and they presume that means they can't be open but often there are ways to be open in responsible you know um responsible ways where your intellectual property is still protected because you have an, a, a license on it but it's an open license which means other people can do something with that and i'll, I'll get onto that in a second but it is some of these uh, some of these other narratives people just presume um that that means they can't be open at all when often they're, they're, they, don't, they don't clash so fundamentally, but people just stay closed out of caution um, because they've gotten some messages that say, oh, that sounds like I shouldn't be open. Um, okay, so people are familiar or a little familiar and some other people are, are unfamiliar with open educational resources. So open educational resources is probably the thing that you hear about the most uh, in this space. So it, it means uh, any kind of... Uh, teaching and learning research materials in any medium that reside in the public domain or have been released under an open license that permits no cost access, use, adaptation and redistribution by others with no or limited restrictions. So, you know, the, the big thing between an educational resource that isn't open at all and an OER is a license. And you can see here that the that David Wiley has the, the five ORs of open, that you can retain a copy of it, you can reuse it, uh, you can revise it, you can adapt it. Now that depends on the license. We'll look at that in a second. Um, you can remix it, put it together with other resources and redistribute it yourself. Now, depend how you can do that exactly depends on the license. So let's get let's get into the licenses. So during at the uh, earlier in the week, um, I came across or I, I listened to a presentation by uh, Robert Schuer, and he was presenting this framework for how to think about these licenses. And I thought it was really nice. So that's what I'm going to use. Um, to, to talk about this. So he has this framework um, where you can see, you know, what is it, what's free, what's not free, what's non-adaptable and adaptable. So adaptable means if I get, if I had a resource uh, and I gave it to you, can you, can you only use it in the way that I gave it to you? Or could you actually change it, change bits of it and then use it with those changes? Um, and he breaks things down into, um, I think that's the next slide. I'll just go to this. Yeah, to what is an open education resource? What's kind of semi-open, and then what's commercial? What's not an OER? But you can see all these, um, all these licenses, all these license types. Um, so public domain is more a legal term. In each country, we will have you know copyright, and when does copyright run out? After seventy years or a hundred years, and then those things are in the public domain. Anyone can kind of take them and do different things with them. And right down at the other end in non-adaptable, we have uh, all rights reserved. We have co copyright. But CC0 means if I took an image and I uploaded it to a, a, a cloud service that was public and I just put CC0 on it, it means you can use that. I don't care. You don't have to say where you got it from. Do what you want with it. CCBY is probably one of the, it's one of the most common ones that is used that means that you can use that image if i put up that image up with a ccby that means you can use it but you have to attribute me if you use that image you have to say that it was my that is my image you have to kind of reference me when you do that ccby sa means you can take my image and use it but you have to share it whatever you put it on if you put it on a document that document also has to be ccby you have to share it the way i gave it to you so uh, CCBYNC, non-commercial means you can use you can use uh, that image, but you can't use it on something that you're trying to make money out of. You can't put that image in a in an online shop and try to sell it to somebody. 
um, CCBYNCSA, more restrictive. You have to attribute me. You can't try to make money off this resource and you have to share it out the way that I shared it with you. Non-derivative, uh, but all those ones inadaptable, all those ones up here, it still means you can take it and you can change my image. Maybe you can put words over my image to be used in, in a different context. If I put ND on it, it means you can't, you can't change anything. You have to take my image the way I gave it and you can only use it in that way. And then you can, you know, that, that's a different combination than BY, non-commercial, uh, non-derivative. So you can see this gives us this matrix of these are open educational resources. You know, these are adaptable up here. Uh, like he gives examples then. So the public, the collected works of Shakespeare are in the public domain. That's kind of a legal thing. If I make a textbook and I make it freely available online and I say you can change it, you can take it, you can put it somewhere else, um, but maybe with different restrictions, that's, you know, that goes into that kind of free space. Now over here in the semi, the semi open, let's say I make an open resource, but I only kind of share it with my colleagues. It's only on an institutional server or something. That's not very, it's open, but it's not open to everybody. It's just open to a little community. And then over in not free at all is like a commercial company going, here's a textbook, you can pay for it and then we'll give it to you. Um, so that's, that is how these licenses work. And it, it, sometimes they can be a little bit alien right at the start, but you know, then we, then we can really get, we can get to grips with it then. So here's an example of an open, uh, an open resource. This is from a, the Go Open guide that we produced earlier this year. We put a CCBY license on this image. We released it separately and, you know, people can take that and they can do what they want with it as long as they attribute wherever they got it from. Um, here is a, a, a more complex example. I was, I led a project many years ago um, uh, uh, that, that made tools to try to make it easier for adults to get into higher education. So this is a tool to figure out, do you have enough time in your week to study? And we put a CCBY license on it. We put the code up on a GitHub page. So people could go to that page, take the code and take this tool and change it, do whatever they want with it, as long as they attribute that they got it from the project. So where do we find these things? There, there's OER repositories um, uh, around everywhere, you know, or there are lots of them. So uh, where you can go and you can explore what is an OER repository. So um, here's an Irish one, a, a one that was recently released by our national forum. Um, and so you can go online, you can go and browse uh, there and there's uh, resources relating to assessment and feedback. There's resources relating to teaching different subjects. Here's one I found uh, from the Philippines. It was like, okay, let's look at the, lo the local context there. And there are some. Um, now, again, it takes, a t it takes some time to get used to navigating these, um, navigating these, these repositories. Um, it's kind of a skill that you have to learn. You have to get used to doing it. And it's easier... It's easier, well, actually, I'll come back to that point in a little bit. There's also, people get worried about that open educational resources won't be of the same quality as something they get from a commercial publisher. But I think there's, 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 ways, around, there's ways around that. We just have to learn to evaluate open educational resources for, you know, are they, is it suitable for our own use? Um, but I think we should be doing that with commercial outputs anyway. Um, so again, there's, there's all sorts of examples like the Smithsonian or the, the Rijksmuseum you know, different institutions like that releasing their whole whole catalogs of images and 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 historical data that are sitting there. So, like, you know, if you need a photo of a tractor or something in one of your lectures, you know, there's probably there's lots of resources being put out there, high quality resources being put out there by different organizations. Um, so there's just that's just some examples. Um, so a type of op open education resource then are uh, open textbooks. And it's often maybe a little bit um, easier to uh, easier to get your head around an open textbook than an open education resource, which can kind of be anything. Um, you know, uh, in, in my, let's say, to give some examples of open education resources, in the learning materials that I make for psychology modules, we use, we use open images. You know, we wouldn't use, we wouldn't go and buy images from a company. We would go and we would source open, you know, open images, public domain or CC with a CC license. And that's what, they're the images that we would use in our learning materials. We look for open videos. We look for, um, you know, different open resources that we might use. If you find a really good, um, you know, list of tips on how to do a certain type of research, 
why wouldn't you take that, use it, acknowledge where you got it from or whatever the license wants you to do, rather than taking the time to you know, write all this out. I often say, how many people in the world right now are writing the same introduction to psychology lecture, all independently, all doing writing exactly the same thing into a different slide deck or, or a set of notes? Um, so um, as an example, in, in our introduction to psychology course, we have gotten rid of the commercial textbook that we used for many years and we switched to this one. This one is a, a really good introduction to psychology textbook. It is an open textbook. It's online. Anyone in the world can go and read that book, uh, no restrictions. Um, you can also take it and adapt it. So, so far I haven't had the time to do that, but like you can see, this is the first Canadian edition. So we're not, you know, I'm not in Canada. Um, so eventually what I would like to do is take this book and talk to the authors and, and negotiate that a little bit, um, just, just, out of courtesy not because i have to because of the license they put on it um and i would like to make an irish edition or a european edition of this textbook and i can do that because it's because of the way it's been licensed um so again someone was mentioning uh, open stacks there here is you, know, you should have access to these slides so all of these are, are links that you can click there are lots of places to find open textbooks um now depending on your subject you might find more or less of these open textbooks you know um but you you can think about whether you want to make an open textbook yourself um you know and i mean some people will say like again you have to kind of get used to these uh you have to get used to these these open textbook repositories you have to uh, get used to finding where they are you have to develop a way of kind of evaluating um evaluating the, the, the open textbooks and saying, okay, is this enough detail to supplement the learning materials I have anyway and all that kind of stuff. But like, don't just go in and sort of jump in and look at everything. Think like what books might I need, you know, and go in and see if they're there, you know, try and search out, be more targeted. Um, and then there are kind of metrics out there for, and I, I think I'll cover those in workshop too, about uh, how to evaluate different uh, open textbooks. Um, So, but let's look a little bit further. You know, often when people start thinking about this area, they only start thinking about, they only, they only think about open educational resources or that's what they hear about, uh, or they, they hear about open textbooks, which are very important, they're very useful. But there is a whole world of practices that go beyond those, or really, like really what, what you know, we're talking about open educational resource, resources or textbooks, what are we really talking about? We're talking about things you can do something with and getting, talking about open educational practices. And here's a definition from, from Catherine Cronin, you know, talking about open educational practices gets us to that point about, okay, now what are we doing? Um, so, you know, open, open teaching and learning, open pedagogy, open educational practices, it's the, it's the integration of open practices, open educational resources and assessment approaches into education. You know, uh, OER pedagogy, OER enabled pedagogy, which is another way of doing it, uh, is the set of teaching and learning practices only possible or practical when you have permission to engage with the five Rs that we were talking about earlier. So that's a, that's a quote from, from David Wiley from 2017. So in practical terms, what kinds of things can we do? You could be using open educational resources like an open textbook in your teaching or development of learning materials. You could be sharing something you've developed. And this is often the bit people don't think about. What have you got that you could share with other people? An infographic, a lesson plan, a video, a slide deck, a whole module, a whole course. You could decide, you know, checking, checking with the institutional rules and all that you could decide to share those things out into the community and make life easier for, for other people. Um, but other things like you could use an open data set in a research methods class, you know, to make it more real world, to make it more authentic and applied rather than using a constructed data set, you know, for the students to work on. Um, and with that last example, we're moving into a whole other ca category of open educational practice where it's not just about what you are doing but what you're doing with students, which adds a whole other layer. And we're going to get really, we're going to get more into that. We're going to get more hands-on with that idea in, in workshop two. So what can you do with students? You, you know, you could co-design a learning resource, like an open textbook or just, you know, a, a video or something. You can, you can uh, co-design that with the students, or, I mean, there's other 
there's other kind of approaches that get more into kind of ideas of student partnership. You could construct a module in a way that you could kind of design or co-design the, the syllabus that you're going to teach with the students. Um, you could give more choice to the students, you know, so for an assessment that they have different different topics they could choose from, or maybe that there's a choice of how to deliver it, that they could deliver it in text, audio or video form, that you're giving them more choice, you're making things a bit more open, um, that you could facilitate students to work in the open. Um, so that would be like, that would be uh, getting students to do blogs or vlogs, you know, or, or something like that, where what they're doing, people in, in the public can see. Um, or uh, another thing specifically, you know, you could get, you could try to produce non-disposable assessments. Um, so, so or, or open pedagogical assessments. So this is like where, you know, it's trying to get away from the idea that students do um, assessments during a year that, that are, that aren't disposable, that we don't just archive in our virtual learning environment at the end of the year and we never see them again. So it's like, how can we get the students to do something that has an impact on, you know, a, a, other students or the, or, or the local community or the public more generally? So things like, again, blogging or vlogging or editing Wikipedia pages, um, you know, all sorts of things like that. Um, these, these forms of assessment, they're a bit more authentic. They're a bit, they can enable students to develop a lot of additional skills that we often want them to develop as students along with their discipline knowledge. Um, so this example, the, 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 what you, you can see on the screen is an example from uh, my own practice where we designed an educational psychology assessment where they write up something initially on how to apply an educational psychology topic to a real world problem. So mental health in schools or building resilience in children. And then they also have to produce a, a infographic or a, a digital poster or a digital pamphlet that would educate either, let's say, staff in a school or the public more generally or parents about that topic. And then we do we release that on a blog. We do release it publicly and get that gets the students thinking very differently about what they about what they do. Um, now, there's things to consider in this area, you know, when you're getting students to produce OERs, you have to give them an out, you know, if you're asking students to work in public, some students that might be dangerous for them, depending on who they are, what their background is, what, you know, um, there might be issues around data protection and data management that are a little complex, and you have to help the students to navigate that. Uh, you might want to give an opt out that students can do it or not doing it, depending on how comfortable they are to put themselves out into the public. Um, uh, so there's, there's all there are risks to acknowledge and explain and then uh, mitigate. Um, but you can have students producing OERs. You can have in, in, in individually or in groups. You can have um, that are then that. I mean, you could do that and not assess it, and then it wouldn't, it'd just be an open practice, but it wouldn't be, but if you assess it, then it becomes an open, an open pedagogical assessment. Um, so what the students produce, you might not make it public, but it might come back into the program. Maybe the students the next year see some of the videos that the students produced as part of the course. And that would be a great way of, you know, having what they make have an impact in the future just within the course. But you could also, like, I, like this example that I was talking about my own, uh, you can release that out into the public where it might have a, a good impact on people out, you know, out in the public. You can also have people just pre, um, engaging with professional communities of practice. So if you have medical students, but they're actually doing an assessment where they're engaging with people in the, you know, on the front lines of the medical profession, that can help them understand the real world a bit more. Um, you can also get people, students collaborating with the, the local community or P, uh, students in other institutions. I heard a good example of um, students from the US and Egypt kind of doing a, 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 an assessment together between two institutions. And again, they're learning about people from other cultures and all sorts of things by doing that. So there's, there's a huge number of ways of doing things, making our assessments a little bit different and using open pedagogical assessment approaches that, that can really it can really open up what we do with assessment. Um, so that that's as much as I want to cover today, and I think I've gone over time. So I want to I want to finish up me talking and get on to the breakout session. Um, so what I want what I want people to look at um, 
in these breakout rooms. Okay, so so one, choose a spokesperson or a note taker. You've done breakout rooms before, so you probably know what I'm talking about there. What I want to hear from is, and especially if maybe me talking about open educational practices makes people realize, oh, I didn't know I was doing an open educational practice, but actually in my class, we do we do engage with this community or we do uh, share what we make with other people in a certain way. I want to try and see what are people doing? You know, what existing open practices or if if within a group, if within a, in a breakout room, there's nothing you, like you don't have any existing examples, what seems possible from what we've been talking about this morning. And also, like, I think that's the most important thing. If you don't talk about anything else, talk about that. But any, you know, as well, if you have time, what, what, how do people feel about that whole idea about open attitudes versus more closed attitudes, uh, individually, societally, in academic culture? And then what are the, what do people th feel like the enablers and the barriers are to engaging in, in this work? Um, so Jay, do you want to launch the breakout rooms? Yes, Dr. James, I'd like to um, call on our technical team For, for people watching the recording afterwards, I suppose I would uh, encourage you to engage as an individual or maybe in a group with with colleagues then about the same topics. You know, what, you know, reflect on what everything you're doing already and see, you know, are you already doing open educational practices, but you just didn't know you were? Or, what, you know, what seems possible? You know, are you thinking now, oh, one of my modules, I always have trouble, yeah, with a textbook. I have terrible trouble myself with, with commercial textbooks, you know, where there's a good license for an ebook version one year and then the publisher makes it much more restrictive the next year. I would much prefer to have an open textbook that just is there on the internet and I can just link to it. If, so if you're thinking, I should go check out some of these open textbook repositories and see if there is a good textbook for topic X, you know, that's great. You know, or if people are thinking, oh, I want to change, I want, I would like to do one of those open pedagogical assessments. That's great. And then thinking about what will make that easier and what will make that harder. Technical team, for the period of time we're in the breakout rooms, do we want to pause the recording in the main room?
Level, sir. Kita. Ayon. Of course. One. Other universities, sir? No. Sharing is limited. Limited ba? Ah. Uh, Extend. Sige. Katong o number one, sir. Ah. We... Monopoly? Ah. We like to ah. a desire to take ownership. The gamit sa classroom. Oh, mo ba? Mo ba Open access sa oh, ma free sa ma free na gamit sa classroom. Ano, Delta Mall. Napag, napag gani, lesson plan. Uh, I-share nila like sa kuan, sa pet simulation. And apoy, napos nila i-share nga lesson plan sa different nga year level na pwede magamit. Uh, gamito na siya nga simulation. So, sign mo, mapag-member lang ka. Sign in lang ka. And then you have free access na yun ato. And then you can modify na dahil mo kung say applicable sa imong klase. Part mong gihapon sa kuan ma'am Claire, no? Kana bitong, kakuan ka ng MIT o CW? Oh, oh MIT ko ko may crosshair. Oh, nadito po daghan. Kaya pwede magamit. Oh. Lumin Learning, MIT ko pen crosshair, pet emulation, open stocks, no? textbook. Tidak pun textbook nak aku. Utorrent. Ma download. Utorrent. Buat mungkin. PDF drive. Libre text. Ma download dapat yang mana textbook. Yang pergi share sama student. Sama Neil. Kalau nama tu ni nak parai kau dan. You discuss pun dengan kau anu. Attitudes, enablers, and barriers. Unsa daw attitudes nga makapahinder sa tuwa para mag-open? Ah. Feedback. <laughs> Feedback? Critic. Kung makritik ang imuang kung ang amot, basin. Ah. Kaya nang dili ka na share. Mm-mm. <laughs> <laughs> Kana, kung kung maula, maula ta. Pag... Maula ta. Siguro. <laughs> Wag say mo gud sa ideas sa kuan kung imo i-open ang imong okay, sa lesson study, i-open yung imong classroom, diba? Medyo nagay certain degree of hesitance yod kay lahi-lahi matag style sa ang pag-handle sa kuan, apil na ba na siya? So kana siguro kung natay mga materials pod kana Siguro dapat ikuan lang gid siya kanang kanang peer evaluation lang gid ang atong materials para somehow pa maka boost og confidence na ko an. Na nice station na ko an, material na i-share sa uban and so on. Ang buot sa ko am I making sense? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> sir. Relatable. Share the same. Mhm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Ikaw may mo report ma'am Ivy no, thank you ma'am. ban colleges o ban universities siguro nasa lay reason nga nung I don't know I I I don't know with the kanang extent sa iyang ko ano kanang ang usage ato but um ang maka istorya gid ana kay si ah silang mam biyong good but to or si mam Harl because she's part of the ano ma the the team pero wala 
man diri da yun. May usually ani kay kuan man mga dili pa mga online ano mga online na mga resources usually ani. Eh, what if pangutan unta ba sa ato ang department na batay na develop na textbook so mo matay matubag nga to katong kay na mambiyong na murag unified na textbook para sa P001 pero kung say na imog factor or reasons na wala siya na murag na limit lang siya to all the students and murag wala siya na continue ata sa karon na online no so reflection <laughs> Hello, wala na ko'y bad na day, Kajusta. Hey, consistency po. Consistency. Bahalagin mo siyang itay. Pero katalagang yung yung i-poll ganina, ang one ba, consistency na mabuhat siya kahit ang magsadapay dagang mga tas, dagang katupagon. Open nang siguro tatanan for exchange for katalang ligi ka na. Ang workload, good. So, ang Solution na na kay tag-18 units sa ganda. Hmm. Masa bang? Enablers. Kanang enables. Enablers daw. Unsa yung maka-enable sa ato ha para maka-open ta? Incentive siguro. Incentive? Pwede. Basing pwede na siya kung reduced workload. Oh, kana. Ay, 56 seconds. Go, kaya niyo na yan, Sir Neil. Mom Ivy. Busy, Neil. Mag-classic ako. Master, siya. With those workloads na, Sir Neil. Nice na. Sure. Okay. Isa pa. Ma Merlin Jo. Naman si Ma Merlin Jo. Ma Merlin Jo. Ay, lagan, man, top 12. Ma Joy Luga. Ma Joy. Ma Ma Ibe. Hi! Iminor ko sa inyo. O, agree po akong busy, sir. Kato, busy. Dili lang sa workload, pati sa ako ang personal life, family life. Ah, sige, sige. Siguro, sub, sir, sa ako kay isa sa mahimong enabler kay ka ng pressure. Ka ng kamutanan ba kay nagbuhat yun dito? So, syempre, ikaw kung ako nagbuhat. So, ma... So how did things go in the breakout room? I think it was fine. A little yeah, bit let me. Dramatic. Yeah, let let me know. Let me know. Uh, I think it's I think it's just two of the groups are going to speak to this, and I I spoke too long earlier, so I, we don't quite have as much time. I'm sorry about that. Um, but yeah, so so, do you want to call that out? Because I I I don't I don't have that document which says which which groups are going to talk, and I'll just shut up, and it should be time for you to tell me something. Anyway. Yeah, I think we have to call a representative or representatives from IDS. Hello, ma'am, sir. I'm sure they already assigned somebody. Hello. Hello, sir Neil. Okay. Uh, so um, there are two questions. First is you ask us to talk about uh, our existing open practices or what seems to be possible. So we had to brainstorm and to try to figure out what exactly you meant by open practice because it's still pretty vague, although uh, we seem to have a, a good overview of what it is. Um, at least it, to us, it means uh, using something that is free and available and also sharing uh, what our students' work are to others for free. And so we, what we came up with is uh, maybe open means um, whatever we do, like when we create quizzes or when we create our syllabus that we share it to others, then we can consider it to be open practice. 
if we have research les lessons or research studies that we share to others, then maybe it is open. And as well, one of uh, our members in our group mentioned that maybe it has something to do with the work of students as well. If we share the work of our students to succeed uh, to other students, then maybe that is open as well. And also, we, as we contemplated over what you mentioned uh, in your talk, um, we've thought that you focused mainly on resources, available resources online that are under Creative Commons, under various licenses. And as we pondered over what resources we have used over the past few uh, years, then two of us, I, three of us are physics teachers. So uh, we mentioned the FET simulations. I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with that. We also talked about Lumen Learning OpenStax for free textbooks and uh, ocw.mit.com EDU was revolutionary when it first came out because to us, uh, we were amazed that a uh, school like the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is willing to share their, I know, their classes online for free. That was really revolutionary, revolutionary for us. At least it was for me. I don't know for others. And But after that, more schools um, and independent organizations followed suit. Then we also talked about, um, actually, um, personally, I think when I think of the internet, I think of um, it being an open thing. Like I can just use something on the internet and do whatever I want to do with it because it's accessible to me. But then of course, uh, <clears throat> the more we use the internet, we encounter things that aren't so free. For example, journals. Now you have to pay to be able to access certain um, doc certain documents or certain studies. Then it wasn't like that at the beginning, I think, but um, I, we felt that as time went by, um, more and more resources online are turning um, not free. <laughs> also, uh, we also talk about the attitudes that hinder us to uh, utilizing this um, kind of approach, I mean open. So one thing that one of my colleagues mentioned is um, the fear of feedback or the feeling of shame because you know what if what you share is not acceptable? Uh, you are shy to show to others what you have done, and you are afraid that others may not like what you share. And there is a definitely a degree of hesitance um, to share. Uh, in that respect. And also close-mindedness because why would you change some, something that already works and um, you are already in your comfort zone and you don't have a growth mindset because you are not comfortable with all these new things that are being thrown at you. Consistency as well. Um, even if you try, it's hard. And um, you are you fall under the valley of, of you know, you hear about something, it, 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 it seems great. And when you try it and it's difficult, then you are under that valley and you can't really overcome it anymore because you are discouraged because the moment you try it, it's hard. So you end up not doing it anymore. And also other um, hindrances are your personal life and your family life. Uh, of course, you have to juggle workload and uh, your life, work-life balance. And how about the enablers? Finally, we also talked about in enablers. Maybe if we are, um, if our workload is reduced and um, if we are provided incentives for doing um, open educational stuff or for contributing to this, uh, contributing resources to the open, if we are given incentive by the school, perhaps then, we uh, uh, we are more than we will be more than willing to do it. So I think that's what I got from the sharing. I don't know if all my other group mates have something else to share as well. If they agree with what I mentioned. Oh, another hindrance though is love life. Uh, I I think I agree. <laughs> anyway, sir James, uh, that's <laughs> that's uh, that that was uh, that was that was excellent, and I've I've taken notes 
uh, it's just going to augment slightly what I cover or how I cover things in the in workshop two. Is there one more group to give feedback, or or do we have time? So Janelle. Hey, Jack. Wow, that's loud. All right, I'd like to call in another group from the Department of Physical Education. Uh, your representative, please. Thank you. All right. Sir Leo. Uh, Sir Leo. Hello. Oh, hello. And Sir Leo, go ahead. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Brunton. Um, for Sir our, Leo, uh, do you want to open your camera? Sorry. Wait for um. Wait for a while. There you have it. <laughs> okay. Just have to open my. that we did okay so um in the department of physical education um based on our um discussion um have we practiced uh doing it already so uh in our case as uh, what had transpired in our discussion we have um identified that uh in in our department we have uh shared um, different ideas and you even collaborate no in, in terms of like um uh crafting the syllabus and uh, sharing of other um resources within the premise of the department but um to the extent of sharing it uh, outside like putting it in um in an op uh, open uh, as an open resource um we have not uh, uh tried that one in the, um, as of the moment, although there are some perhaps like um, sharing output of students in public such as posting in, in, in social media or in YouTube. Um, however, um, the extent of you know having it shared like uh, it's a really uh, a practice uh, with, with all the members of the department um, is not really uh, established. And we have identified factors that, um, that possibly um, hinders the, the, the practice of having it uh, being in, uh, open to the public. Number one is be, uh, because of the notion that um, we, we, we tend to think that um, our idea is uh, should we will take ownership of the ideas or or the um um the the, the different uh things that we have made and we take ownership to that and uh, and next second is the notion that uh, as what mr neil has um, mentioned earlier that um the uh, the work will be um, subjected to because it, it will be available um, to everyone and then the, the chances of, of having uh, criticisms no um, uh, the, having the thought of being criticized openly no and being uh, subjected to mga, uh, the negative uh, comments perhaps so that uh, actually, hinders the um the practice of of doing that uh and, and, and sharing it to the public so what seems possible so um we have started it uh, within our premise in the department so perhaps uh, the only way to do it is to to do the the, the first step and uh, we need to have we need to um to, to work on it as a as a team and um perhaps we need more 
uh, support such as uh, training or such as more uh, workshops on this and how we are able to uh, to to deliver uh, effectively this kind of uh, uh, endeavor. So I guess that would be all for the sharing for the Department of Physical Education. Uh, uh, is there anything um, from my uh, colleagues to, uh, no, to, to add? Anything more to add? Okay. I guess there's none. And that would be all. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Leo, for that uh, input. I'd like to turn over the floor to Sir James if uh, Sir James have additional insights and inputs for us. I mean, I, I, I don't want to, I don't, I've already, I have already caused this event to go over time. So I, I don't want to go too long. All I'm saying is like, that, that was amazing. And that's exactly, I think what people were talking about is exactly what I want the people to talk about, to get those, get, get those kinds of ideas going. And I, if I can try to sell or upsell workshop two, I think workshop two, we're really going to go further. We're going to go deeper on on, on on what I was talking about, plus what those discussions that were happening in the breakout rooms, I think workshop two will really push us further and try to answer some of those questions, answer some of those concerns, address some of those hesitancies, and again, really push kind of like, okay, what could the next steps be? What could what could people do? And what challenges will that address? You know, what is in it for you to try and do that? Um, even even if even if our institutions don't reward us hugely for doing it when we do it. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. James. And I guess uh, that's the end of our workshop for today. Before can we I, close, I though, Dr. James, though, I, go ahead, Sir Jay. Yeah, I think um, what, we, what we also are interested about, Dr. James, is that the way in which we could maybe, or the how we could indicate, you know, the restriction when we are already have produced a, a work or a product or something, how do we do that? Do you mean it's something that you've already produced? Yeah, so how do you we like put it, put like CC or whatever? I mean, liter liter literally, um, it's as easy as, um, let's, say, let's, say, let's say there's no one else you have to negotiate what license you want to put on a piece of work. Let's say as part of a lecture that you produced, you made a diagram and it's your diagram. You know, you didn't take it from anybody else. It doesn't belong to anybody else. You made a diagram. You could take that diagram, go to the Creative Commons uh, license website, you know, just, just, you know, search in an internet browser, just search for Creative Commons, you'll find the website. Uh, think about how you want to share this. Do you want to share it totally openly? Do you want to just share it so people can do whatever they want with it as long as they t say they got it from you, that it's your diagram? Um, are you worried that you don't want people to make money out of your diagram? If so, you can put non-commercial on it. Are you? Yeah, do you want to make sure that they share it the way you shared it? Then you can put share a like on it. So you choose the particular license and then you just copy the little you just copy the little image or save that image and you just put that down on the corner of your diagram and then share that on share that through a social media platform share it on twitter or go to one of the the uh, open educational resource repositories and upload it or whatever process that repository has for sharing that that's it. That's it. Now, again, within an institution, you might need to talk to your line manager. There might be an institutional um, policy about what you do or how you share things. And you need, you know, you may, you might need to ch check that out. Um, but like in general, that's as easy. It's as easy as just including the license. And then it's very helpful uh, if you kind of put a reference, you know, help people if you know when you say you can you can do whatever you want with this resource as long as you attribute me help them with that attribution you know give them the little the little line that says when you're attributing me this is what you should put on your like today i put on a slide i said this is taken from this person you know because they shared their slides and on the end of the slide deck it's a, it's shared ccby so i can take from that i can take stuff out of that presentation no problem as long as i say i took it from that person 
So it, it's as easy as that. Uh, you know, notwithstanding other. So, so the link is the Creative Commons link is just very accessible in the in yeah. Google. Yeah. Okay. Any, yeah. Anywhere, and like you know, all you need is those little images and your decision about what level of sharing you want to do. Thank you very much, Dr. James. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. James. I think uh, many of our colleagues uh, basically resound the same uh, sentiment and question about when do we use the, the Creative Commons license? How do we use it? What is the criteria by which we can use it actually? So uh, thank you so much for your input. And uh, yeah, I think we would be learning more about that on the upcoming workshop. That would be on the 6th of October, the same time in the Philippines. And I would like to um, remind everyone that we have an evaluation form, which would also be your attendance for today. So be sure to click them and uh, sign yourselves in in that uh, particular um, form. So I'd like to thank uh, the IDS group and the DPE group for sharing your, uh, um, your presentations. And uh, the rest of the teams for the DSME, DPRE, and DTPE, you would have your chance for the upcoming workshop next week. So I guess uh, we'll have that. And um, I would like to uh, ask uh, our coordinator for other announcements if there are any, but I guess, uh, and I think, yeah, I think that's it. So the most important thing is that we'll see you again on 6th of October for our second workshop. Once again, our sincere gratitude to our visiting professor for sharing your expertise uh, with us, uh, Dr. James, and uh, for all of us present today. Thank you very much. Before nice. we go, I would like to ask everyone to open your cameras and let's take a photo opportunity with our visiting professor. And all right. I will try, Thank you very I will much. try next week uh, to keep the time better. And I'm seeing. All right. And so I'd like to ask our uh, tech team to uh, do the screenshot for us. Thank you very much. First screen, three, two, one. All right, happy smile. Second screen in three, two, one. And my third screen, pa, last. In three, two, one. All right. Thank you very much. And once again, uh, I wish everyone a good afternoon and uh, blessings and protection wherever you are. Thank you so much, Dr. James. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, everybody. See you next week, hopefully. Thank you, Dr. James. I would like to announce also that the evaluation form is now um, um, sent to our chat box. Thank you, everyone. Sir Jay. Yes, sir. Pwede ka makapangayos sa recorded ani, sir? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Para sa synthesis, ako ay kuan, klaro. Thank you, sir. Wala na ni attendant Sir Jay. Yan si Sir Jay. Ang evaluation form, ma'am. Ah, okay. Diretso na lang. Mm -mm.